Affordable housing, are we getting closer to making it more available? Or are we getting further and further away? We'll discuss this issue on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. June is National Home Ownership Month. Originally, National Home Ownership Month started as a week-long celebration during the Clinton administration in 1995. Seven years later, President George W. Bush proclaimed June as the month to celebrate home ownership. But today, in many parts of the country, home ownership for many is getting more and more out of reach. Hundreds of thousands have lost their homes through foreclosure. And for those who are renting, even the act of renting homes or apartments is getting to be exorbitant. So where does affordable housing exist? On this show, I will talk with four individuals who are working with both homeowners and renters to keep housing prices more affordable. Seated to my far left is Joshua Hug, who is the program manager for the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County, an organization which works with communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality affordable housing. Next to him is Gabriel Ben Wellos, a 14-year-old student who will be starting high school in September. Gabriel is a community organizer who is working with families who live in an apartment complex in Redwood City. To my immediate right is Daniel Saver, who is a housing attorney for Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. Daniel provides legal services to individuals and works with grassroots community groups as a community advocate. Michael Francois is seated to my far right. Michael is an East Palo Alto resident who volunteers as a community organizer and community activist. Well, thank you very much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you with me, all four of you. So <coughs> I mentioned at the top of the show about June being National Home Ownership Month. Tell me, how did we get from celebrating home ownership to where we are today with so many houses in foreclosure? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is that a lot has changed since 1995, uh, particularly over the last few years. Um, and then if you get more specific here in California and then in Silicon Valley, things have changed even further. Uh, home ownership has been a, um, a, a beautiful aspiration to have uh, when it comes to being part of the community. You are literally buying a piece of the community and uh, and with that you are also providing uh, buying into you know one of the most powerful mechanisms for wealth generation uh, that we have particularly for the middle class. Uh, beyond that you get into investments and uh, that takes a certain level of savvy but just owning a home and paying your mortgage every month has really empowered a lot of people uh, to build their nest egg and become a consistent um, participant in the growth and uh, prosperity of our communities. Over the last few years, uh, to starting in, in late 2007, was the foreclosure crisis. Um, in an effort, I believe during the uh, Bush administration, there was a strong push to increase home ownership. And you had a lot of people getting into mortgages that uh, they really weren't prepared to handle. Okay, I'll, I'll um, ask Daniel at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Joshua said home ownership was a, a way to gain wealth. And so you've been working with people who have been far from gaining wealth, I would say 
Well, how would you describe some of the <laughs> clients that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, um, so I tend to work with renters. And as you mentioned in the introduction, the, the major issue here, specifically in Silicon Valley, is that even renting is proving tremendously difficult for many families. Um, you know, low-income families, working-class families, middle-income families. It's incredibly difficult just to pay the rent. Um, as Josh was saying, in the last couple of years, the cost of housing in this area has skyrocketed. We're seeing rents increasing, you know, nearly 50% over a four-year time period. Uh, that's astronomical. People's wages aren't increasing 50% over a four-year time period. So uh, the the problem that a lot of renters are facing is there's just no chance, really, to save up enough money to purchase a home, particularly in this market when homes in this area are going for well over a million dollars. And those who have their homes, uh, a lot of them are losing them or have lost them. Yeah, certainly. I mean, during the foreclosure crisis, we were hit badly, as many places were, and um, several communities were hit worse than others. I mean, East Palo Alto particularly bore the brunt of the foreclosure crisis in this area. A large number of people lost their homes, and what wealth they were able to build disappeared, out. disappeared overnight. Okay. Um, and the real, you know, I think what kind of adds insult to injury, I just heard a story today about a person who my office is working with who had bought a home, uh, lost that home to foreclosure. Uh, the home was purchased by an investor who then turned around and rented that same house out to the family who had previously owned it. So not only was their wealth completely obliterated, but they, th I think that when they were describing this, it almost felt like an indignity to them, that they had been the owner of this space, they had lost it all, and now they're just paying rent to someone who lives far away. Do they have an option along the way to buy their house back or not, tell me? Yeah, yeah not this family. so much more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Gabriel, I had mentioned that you're 14 years old. Yes. You'll be going to high school in September. So how, tell us what you're doing and how you got involved. Well, we were first told April 24th that they had changed owners, that uh, our property owner had sold it to FPI management. Then six days later, we received an eviction letter. Uh, your mic is kind of down, so I just want to make sure. Keep on talking that everyone can hear you. And So is this the apartment complex that you're in? Yes. That it had been sold had and been sold. everyone in it? Everyone in it. Was being it. evicted? Yes. How, how many? There uh, are 18 uh, families. 18 families. And 31 kids living in the building. Were, did they have leases? Um, some families did, but um, they expired July of this month. And they were the, told this coming up month. in April. And we were told in April we had two months. To get out? To get out. OK, so are the families still there? Um, some families have been able to go back into other apartments, but their rent is just almost double that they paid there. And the families that are still there cannot afford to move out. So what will happen to them? They'll be evicted? Um, I think we will have to uh, stay and see what happens. Then after our two months have gone by, we will probably receive a letter from so what are you, you're part of a group that's protesting. What are, what's the group doing? Um, right now? Uh, yes, go on. And I, I was, well, tell us what the group is doing and maybe what you're doing specifically. Right now we have been trying to get as many meetings as we can with city council. And we've been able to have two, one this coming up July 2nd and one which is happening at this moment. And what I'm doing, I am in charge of the press to contact other press at the complex and... So what are you all hoping the city council will do? We're hoping that they pass a law that for um, house stabilization 
and no more rent increases. In okay, so I guess that would be rent stabilization. Huh? Yes. Ah, okay, great. So, Michael, we've talked. We've been talking about uh, foreclosures and also rent increases. You're working on the end of in the area of stopping foreclosures. Yes, um, <clears throat> a few of us have gotten together. Um, some of the tenants of homes that own homes, and some of the people that rent because uh, they've tried to negotiate and talk to the banks that own various houses, but the banks have sold their loans to these subprime uh, or these second, second tier home, uh, what do you call them when they buy, when they sell your, lane, uh, sell your loan? What do you call these? They're, Oftentimes they get packaged and sold as investments. Yeah, as so investments. Like packages of loans. So do you think this is just an excuse mm -hmm. that the banks are giving, that they can't do anything, that they've sold it, and uh, these homes are now out of their hands? Oh, is that they, just an excuse? I think that's just an excuse, because right now is a great time, especially in this area, the San Mateo County, this area. you got to remember, this area has Facebook, which is only... 2.5 miles from Google, which is only 15 miles from Apple, and Facebook is probably 14 miles from Oracle. And, and we're right in between three major airports, and in this area, uh, we have a lot of people who have what they consider money. They need a place to live. So what that means is I would think rents are going to go up even more and the price of housing will go up even more, and houses will turn over to the highest bidder, given the Silicon Valley tech companies and the high prices that they're paying to their workers. You're right. Um, in fact, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors heard an argument, maybe, I don't know, Mr. Hughes may know about this. They heard a, somebody mention it that they were considering, at least they heard a person mention that they need a county, they should have a countywide rent control system put in place. Because as you, if you drive around in San Mateo County along El Camino and all the fast foods and the auto parts stores where you have um, low wage workers work, used to work, you see now hiring, now hiring, now hiring. But, but I, I would think certainly property owners and maybe um, owners who, um, what, landlords who are not living in their houses would certainly not be for rent uh, ordinances that would keep them from raising the prices as high as they could raise them. Yeah, I mean, certainly not. You know, And I think there the question is, are public officials are supposed to be looking out for the public welfare and the general good of everyone? And not looking out specifically for people who want to turn a massive profit. That's not the role of government to just facilitate a couple of people getting rich while everyone else struggles, at least not in my opinion. And so I think the, we, we need some leadership from our public officials to say, you know, we value having an inclusive community. We think it's important that folks all along the income spectrum are able to call this place home. We think it's important that folks are able to live near where they work. Uh, we like our neighborhoods and our communities. Um, we're certainly open to investment in them, but we don't want investment if it comes at the price of displacing all of the current residents. Uh, and I think really when you consider some of the different policy options that a lot of these folks have at their disposal, what it's really ultimately about is community stabilization. It's about helping keep people in their homes, the people that form the fabric of the communities that we live in, it's about helping them survive this crisis, which at this point has just completely run out of control. So uh, it's very normal that when something goes out of control, government will step in in order to try and level the playing field a little bit. Is that normal, Josh? I would think sometimes it all depends on uh, where the money is flowing. Well and to which politician <laughs> and... Uh, well, if, you, if you look at the end of the day, though, um, you know, it's, it's um, the ounce of prevention approach because really, um, as Daniel said, if we, you know, what kind of community do we want to have? But sometimes, 
you know, it, even if we wanted to bring in as many high-tech, high-paid workers as we want, we still have vital services that need to be paid for. And oftentimes, people try to compensate. When their rents are increased, uh, they will pay the increase, and then they'll forego something else. And then ultimately, you know, over time, you know, those, those um, compensations manifest themselves in different ways, whether it's health, educational instability, hiring and retention of workers. Ultimately, when someone's displaced and yet they're still working here, uh, they not only have to clog the roads with extra traffic to come back here, uh, but they're probably sick of driving, you know, 30, 45 an hour uh, commute every day. So um, that, that employer in this, in this county will have a tougher and tougher time hiring those workers uh, the statistic has been that you know for every tech worker you're generating two to three, some say four to five um, service level worker uh, jobs. Uh, those people, we are not making room for those people. Uh, the market uh, right now has been catering almost exclusively to uh, the higher end because the demand is there. Um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, when I moved here 15 years ago, I was an engineer at Intel. Intel guaranteed me the ability to buy a house here. So, you know, if it, was, if it cost this much, they made it possible for me to pay that much. Whether it was my salary, points on my mortgage, down payments, they uh, gave me a signing bonus to help with my down payment, all kinds of different ways to ensure I could buy a house. So I was, a co I was the competition who had no ceiling. And yet we are expecting people who are doing the mainstream jobs of, in the community to be able to compete with that. And particularly here in Silicon Valley, we talked about the downturn and the foreclosures. Well, we, when the, when the economy uh, surged back here, we were the last into the recession and we were the first out. And just in the last three years here in the county, we, ge we have generated 40,000 new jobs and built 3,000 homes to accommodate those people. 40,000 new jobs at what, a technical level? Uh, a range of incomes. Really? Sure, sure. Well, if again, if you're going to hire uh, a programmer, well, there's support staff. Yes, and then there's but the that, concurrent. that, that, that um, kind of assumes that the, um, the, the licenses or the go-ahead for building housing is being given with knowledge of what the needs are in terms of the community. Unfortunately, things have devolved over the years, particularly since Prop 13, where the ability for, for uh, local government to generate revenue has been stifled. Yes. So <clears throat> they, there is something what they call the uh, fiscalization of land use. When you look at a property, how can you generate enough revenue yes. that it pays for itself so the services that the rest of the community expects can be delivered. And that's usually, I would think, what most government leaders are looking at. How can they um, generate, an, their cities and communities, municipalities, generate enough revenue to provide social services? For the residents who are here today. Okay, now, let me ask you, Gabriel, you had talked about meetings with the city council in Redwood City, and I think you said you've had one meeting already. Yes. Uh, what was the response? Um, I don't know because it's happening right now. Oh, this yes. is the first <laughs> meeting <laughs> happening right now. Your colleagues are there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, Gabriel yeah. did tell me that there was a meeting <laughs> that yes. he, he might have to go to, but I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, do you know, well, do you have any idea, were there some city council members who were receptive to attempting to stop the evictions? Um, we had, we have been trying, well, the committee in Redwood City had been trying to get Alicia Aguirre. She has, a, she has been accepting, but then cancels. Oh, city council members. Yes, but um, today she, said yes, and they're meeting uh -huh. with her right now. Okay, how did you personally get involved in this protest? You're living in an apartment yes. where the families are being evicted. So what, 
I, I'm sure there are other young people your age living in the apartment who are not involved in the type of protests that you're involved in. So what is it that encouraged you or inspired you to get involved? Well, I just like it. I like helping other people and I like being involved in the building because I've been there for a lot, 10 years and I was basically in first grade when I went, when I started living there. And everything that happens there I know about and I, I wish I could still be living there oh, by the end of the month. Ah, so you all, so is your family, oh, so you may have to leave by the end of June? A begin end of July? Probably will, might have to leave by the end of July. Are you all looking at options? Right now, we want to stay in Redwood City, but it's too expensive. Rents are double the amount that we pay at our, ho our home right now. And if we can't live here on the peninsula, then we'll have to move somewhere else. Sure. Now, you had talked about rent ordinances, mm -hmm. and that's an area in which you're working. Yes. Um, I, what is it? I, it? It seems to me there is an ongoing struggle between a property owner and a city that has rent ordinances. For the, the property owner, it's a mi matter of maximizing the, the income. Mm -hmm. the revenues. Yeah. So what's the leverage that a city would have in terms of um, making a difference? Uh, the cities have ultimate leverage because they can just enact laws. Uh, so you know they, uh, I mean assuming there's courage, political courage, uh, and they're not being unduly persuaded by you know campaign contributions for example, uh, the cities can simply impose these laws. These, so rent stabilization, just cause for eviction, relocation benefits, these are laws that have been upheld by the courts as constitutional for decades, I mean like 40 years. So there's no question as to the legality of these policies. It really is a matter of politics. It's a question of whether there is political will um, amongst our elected officials to take steps to protect their constituency, to protect their existing residents. So um, is this, is there maybe a conflict of interest because cities get revenue, tax revenues, right, from the property owners. Mm -hmm. And that revenue, is that tax dependent upon what? The income that the property owners are receiving or the assessed value of the apartment building? I'm glad you brought that up because it's on the assessed value of the property, but uh, property owners have essentially a form of rent stabilization, which is Prop 13, which Josh mentioned. So in the state of California, if you own a piece of property, your property tax can't go up more than 1% a year. It, it's essentially a way of capping the increase in cost based on the rising cost of living. And so homeowners already enjoy this benefit. The question is why are renters not being treated with equal fairness? Why are they not being given that same benefit of having some predictability? You know, if you're a homeowner and you buy a place, you know moving forward you have a fixed rate mortgage, you know what those payments are gonna be, you know that even if your neighborhood starts becoming really expensive, you're only going to, your property taxes are only going to increase a tiny little bit each year. Um, renters that live in jurisdictions that don't have these protections have no such uh, security. You know, for them, if you're on a month-to-month -month tenancy, they can give you a $1,000 rent increase. They can give you a $1 million rent increase. It's not illegal to give an enormous rent increase as long as there's proper notice. And all that's required for a rent increase that's that long is just that's that big is 60 days. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Yes, and he's right about that. <clears throat> that happened in uh, Burlingame or Belmont last month. People came down and complained to the Board of Super... Oh, it hit the paper. Mm -hmm. that yeah, I think Burlingame, I think. Burlingame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Numerous residents, senior residents, mm -hmm. were given rent increases from 800 to 1,600, from mm -hmm. 700 to 1,500, just overnight. Mm -hmm. It just came out of nowhere. But it, it was legal. They have no rent control. We have it here in East Palo Alto. But talking to people, 
being involved with the community, marching up and down the street. What I have found out now, people on Section 8, since Section 8 has a cap of 1950. Section 8 housing. Housing. Which is government supervised, uh, government subsidies. under subsidies. subsidies. Yeah. A lot of people are telling me they've had every six months or so, maybe Joss or you will know, um, they're going up $200. Every it seems like every six months going somebody up tells the me they their rent goes up two hundred dollars. Now the people on rent control are under control. You know they can only go up so much. But as soon as they step out of that apartment, it goes to market rate. Mm -hmm. right. You know they can't even pass it on. They're I think the city should say you need to keep a certain percentage if you want to operate in this city, which is East Palo Alto. This is my opinion because the city can put this out. If you want to have your business in East Palo Alto, you need to keep a certain percentage of your apartments below market rate or keep them um, so uh, why under should, stabilization. Yes, yes because but why should a property owner agree with those terms when uh, they would say they want to maximize their revenues and keeping some apartments below market rate would not maximize their revenues. I think that, you know, so the, there's a question around what's, I think you hit it right on. You know, if you want to do business in our community, we have some ground rules. There's just some businesses that are, or the business models that are repugnant to our community's values. So for example, you know, drug trafficking, that's a business, they just want to make money, but we don't let them do that. Um, lots of other things, you know, being a landlord, that's not a necessarily repugnant business. We're not saying that people can't operate their business and make money doing it. Operate but, their business and at the same time deal with the increases that they would get in terms of maintenance and repairs yeah, and rebuilding. Yeah. Everything is going up. <laughs> Everything is going up and certainly, you know, I'm not advocating for, you know, preventing landlords from charging any rent increases ever. You know, there needs to be a fair rate of return, but what we're seeing now, given the market, yeah. is that the rates of return aren't fair. No. The rates of return are astronomical. It's price gouging. And I think this is where our community needs to step in and say, if that's your model, if your model is to buy a building and kick out 18 families, including 31 children, that business model is something that we actually just don't want in our community. So Josh, uh, the organization, the agency that you work with, works with communities and the leaders of those communities to, uh, according to the website, preserve quality housing. Right. So given what we're, we've been talking about, uh, like the leaders in Burlingame or Belmont that don't have rent ordinances, what, what, what are the options? What, what can you do or what can your agency do well, Burling, to, to make things equitable? I mean, Burlingame is a special case. Um, they, have, they had a ballot measure back in the 80s that precludes, them from, from, precludes the council from implementing rent stabilization. So that would have to be overturned there. In other cities, the count, an action by the council can, can enact that. Are you more familiar with that? Do you know what the argument was when that with was? Regard to, oh. when that uh, to be honest, uh, I think there's very little institutional me memory about that. Um, in fact, uh, it really wasn't until last year that they even realized that that ballot measure had been passed. It was never; it had never been recorded uh, in city in the city code until a citizen had reminded them that this thing had passed. And was there any action or any uh, well, suggestions of overturning it? Uh, well, it would take either a, uh, it would take a ballot initiative either initiated by the council itself or uh, a citizen-led uh, uh, measure, measure uh, gathering signatures and, and so forth. So I think from what I read that most, Burlingame has one of the highest rates of apartment dwellers. They are actually majority renter. Oh, okay. Uh, so they would be enormously impacted. Yes, more than half the community is on this tragic roller coaster that we, we experience in Silicon Valley. And what's, what are their options? Well, they, there are you know, other measures that can be passed, um, but they often complement each other. You know, ju things like what Daniel said, just cause eviction, for instance. Uh, that narrows 
the number of reasons that allow a landlord to evict a, a, a tenant. They're, you know, they have to, you know, set fire to the apartment or not pay their rent or, you know, actually um, do things that uh, would not be considered uh, being a good tenant. Uh, today, though, you know, for any reason, a, a tenant can be evicted. So that could certainly be passed by a vote of the council. The big loophole there is certainly that the landlord still has the discretion to increase rents by $1,000 and you, you have the same outcome. So often these, these uh, ordinances complement each other. So for the residents of Burlingame, uh, they've gone to the city council and the chances are, uh, would they have any kind of relief? I mean, the city could pass some ordinances, perhaps, they can, but they would be they wouldn't be retroactive. So, well, they can certainly, you know, just the the measures that Daniel had mentioned, um, just cause eviction, relocation benefits, other things along those lines, uh, can certainly be done by the council. And of course, they could initiate a, a ballot measure themselves. Uh, that would also depend on, you know, really with any ballot measure, it's who shows up to vote. So. Mm -hmm. Um, homeowners tend to have a, a, a more consistent voting record, so you would have to change those dynamics within the city. My original question for you was more or less what are you finding in terms of the cooperation or other leaders in other communities? Well, every, to preserve affordable housing well, in, in San Mateo County. Right, right. Um, Every, every city in the county is wrestling with this. Uh, mostly, or, or I'd say more so in South County, simply because of the, uh, the corporations that have established themselves there. Though there is pressure in North County, um, s you know, San Francisco companies moving, uh, moving south. We have a thriving biotech uh, um, community in Foster City in, in South San Francisco. So there's pressure there as well. Um, I mean, there's no... I think this is one of the underlying themes is that, you know, in order to address this, uh, we are at, a, at a, a real low point when it comes to housing affordability here and our ability to respond to it. Uh, between the economy crashing um, because of certain court cases that have precluded communities from using, uh, implementing what they call uh, inclusionary housing. Uh, there was a, another court case recently that overturned that or, or reinforced the ability for for cities to do it for ownership but not for rentals. That's, so there's a, a bit of a puzzle that's being um, uh, having to be solved in that regard. Um, and then we lost all this funding with the loss of redevelopment. Over a billion dollars a year across California was lost uh, when redevelopment went away. So cities are looking for uh, new sources of funds, new policy measures, um, there's, you'll, you'll be seeing this summer a lot of discussion around what they call development impact fees. Mm -hmm. And that is um, and they enacted after, uh, in fact, East Palo Alto actually did it last right. year. They, yeah. they were um, ahead of the First those. one out of the... Right. Out of the Them and Daly City, actually. Course, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some other cities that have it, San Carlos and Menlo Park, but most of the other cities don't have anything. The purpose of that is really just to show that new workers here, new residents, market rate residents, generate a demand for service level workers. And therefore it needs to be, that situation needs to be mitigated by paying for the ability of those service level workers to live here. So you, they, they attach a fee to that development, whether it's commercial development or even residential development. So there is one more thing. You had mentioned two factors, and I'm thinking there is a third factor and that's the shortage of available housing and perhaps the shortage of land, a mm, limitation yeah. in terms of land that people can build and, and multifamily housing on. And it's gotten even more difficult because yeah. um, not only do we have a shortage of housing, and that's, uh, there's a variety of factors that have, you know, the, the frozen capital markets that we, you know, funding even commercial construction, uh, private construction of, of housing. Um, now that's starting to loosen up here in particular. Um, but the land um, we have in our communities, what used to be redevelopment, those redevelopment areas, the downtowns, um, have also been uh, designated priority development areas. And as such, they are eligible for regional and federal 
funding to go into those areas. What that has done by designating these priority development areas, which will which are intended to absorb 80% of our new growth over the next 25 years, we've telegraphed to landowners that there, there will be significant transportation and infrastructure investment in those areas. The land values in those areas have gone up considerably. And as our downtowns start to revitalize, that'll, it'll get even more expensive. Sure, that's not a... It's, so what, what that has done is, you know, Make, it makes it that much more difficult for um, affordable housing developers to build in those areas because of the high land prices. And then the people who are living in proximity to that, who are living in just you know, cheaper housing because it just happens to be older, uh, those prices go up as well. So we, it, we've created this engine for displacement, really. Um, and we have yet to build either the protections or the mechanisms for inclusion um, to, to allow average people to live here. All right, now I'd like to go to you, Gabriel, because you have been quietly sitting, listening <laughs> to all of this. <laughs> and I'm wondering, what do you make of it? What do you understand from all of this? I understand almost everything this <laughs> you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, I do agree on that it's not easy to buy or rent in Silicon Valley, that from San Francisco down to San Jose, mm -hmm. and across the bay, it's even it's getting harder over there also. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to. There's been a lot of construction around Redwood City, like new buildings going up, but they're saying that they're low income apartments, but. There's one that's going to be 144 units, and only three are for low income. For three units out of 144 will be low income. So as a future leader, and I, I assume being very active and very aware of what's going on now, uh, what would you do? What do, what, what do you think should be done? I think they should. Uh, make these laws in Redwood City, not just in Redwood City, but all over California. What, rent ordinances? Rent control. And, um, what's it called? Just cause. Just cause, yeah. yeah. So if yeah. you were a property owner, and I assume one day you might want to be a property owner, how would you feel if somebody came to you and said, no, you have to limit how much you can charge in renting your property. I'm not sure <laughs> what I would do, but I would try to limit so that p people would stay, would have a stable home and not be moving around, especially if they have kids. So I, I would assume because you are in that position of your family possibly being evicted, that you have a certain sensitivity or understanding of what it means to be in a situation like that. Yes. So, yes, Michael. You know, I wanted to comment on a couple, I'll try to do it real fast because we don't have much time, but a couple of things, you, you talked about politics. Remember you said this, this housing pleasure we had, we were talking about started in 90... 1995. 95. Under the Clinton administration, housing was moving and great. Everybody was getting a house because <clears throat> things were going up. You know, every three months, if you buy a house, by the time it was finished, it was twenty thousand dollars. Houses were going up too fast. You know, my houses in East Palo Alto were at five hundred, somewhere even at a million dollars. I said it's got to stop. You know, and then at the time when Bush took over, all of a sudden people hated him and. They hated the Enron thing, and then he was in a war, so of course he was going to support it. I think it was just a smokescreen thing to get people off of that so they would not hate him so much. So they, oh, he's not a bad guy, even though he's fighting a war and we're spending all this money. I think that was a smokescreen. That's my opinion. Also, you talked about politicians. Well, you got the high-tech people, you got the real estate owners, and you got judges and so forth. They all party together, and I know they party together. I used to work corrections. I've seen them all, all the lawyers and everything. They all get together. People with money party together. And they support them in their campaigns. You know, I'm surprised that Attorney General, um, you've had her on your show, um, 
used to be in a, a judge. Um, oh, Lodoris? Lodoris. No. Yes. I, I think she's now attorney general or something. No. No, it was another one. But there's, we have the attorney general of California, mm -hmm. and we Long have the attorney. Kamala um, Harris. Kamala Harris. And then we have attorney general of the United States yes. and the Obama Look, administration. Yes. They know these things are going on, but not one has said anything about it. Not one has come out and did anything. And they can stop this. They can pass laws. In fact, Obama can pass a law by executive sign and just stop it right now. But they won't because all these people are being supported by where you think they get their monies from. That's true. I would, what? I would think at the moment the Obama administration might be facing so many other fires. Yeah, but, <laughs> like but, immigration. Uh, and well, but still, it just this had Obamacare passed. And well, we still got people here. You don't compromise the safety of the people who put you there or the people you were elected to protect. You were elected within a county, a city, a county, a state, a country, whatever. Your obligation is to take care of home first, no matter what else. Take care of home first. Then you can ask the people, I need to raise their taxes to do this. I need to raise their taxes to do that. You don't let corporations rule you. You do not let corporations rule you. This is part of, uh, and I'll end it right now, this is a part of this Agenda 21, if people look it up. They want to stack them and pack them. That's why you see throughout the Bay Area, you'll notice that there's a lot of buildings like this with stores on the bottom. They want people to live like that. Every city is doing that. Stack them and pack them. Drive around and look. Stack them and pack them. In San Francisco... Is that a good thing? It, there's some good about it, but it's some bad. It, look at the cost. You hear the cost, what they're talking about. San Francisco has a program that seems to work, because what I do in San Francisco, I install cable in the buildings. And I always question, are these low income, are these high incomes? And they say, well, upstairs the higher income, but certain part of this building, this building is all high income, whereas this building over here is mixed income. And they try, the building kind of reflects the city. Well, it seems, from what I recall, San Francisco is facing some of the very same problems that we're talking about with a very high rate of evictions, and neighborhoods are changing. They're changing, but and those were and not in the favor of those who are low and moderate income. Mm -hmm. But they do have a lot of buildings that's going. In fact, a lot of buildings around the baseball park. Some of them are not all high income, even though some of them are very high. Some of them are. You can go, and the list will say low, very low, low, moderate, and so on and so on. Okay, Henry, Josh. If I can just weigh in on a couple things. Sure. I guess one. Sure. Um, the uh, the compact housing, the de high density housing, um, is that the preference for that is really born of pragmatism, because particularly here in this county, uh, for a variety of reasons, we're not building into the bay anymore. We're not building into the hills anymore. Right. That just gives us tiny slivers of land to accommodate people having kids, people getting older and needing to change their home situations. Uh, and then all these workers that are coming here as well. We have, you know, we are the center of, of innovation for the country and some say the world. Um, because of those constraints, um, and we want to get people out of their cars to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, living near transit, and that's really what the, the, the focus is here, is housing near transit. How do we maximize the amount of housing near transportation options? Um, if I had the opportunity, I, I would have taken the train here today. Uh, I do not want to sit in traffic on 101 and, and now 280 more and more. So um, the idea of, of building high density around transit is, um, is really born out of you know, a lack of options. But many neighborhoods don't want high density buildings. Well, consider the options. Either we can start the spread out and people hate that. We, we're not going to bulldoze uh, single-family home neighborhoods. Um, we only have, you know, we, we're looking at infill, really. There's no wide open spaces to, in, in which to expand. Yeah, I mean, the idea is to put the density housing in the right place. You know, no one's saying go into a single-family home neighborhood and completely change the character. I think what Josh was just talking about, this kind of transit-oriented development, is say, well, there are, we need more housing. So where are we going to put it and how are we going to do it? And how are we going to reduce the impact? Exactly, yeah. 
And I, and I think you know that's a that's a sensible kind of urban regional planning. organizations are looking at that. Certainly, Do you yeah. think and of cities cities are looking at that also mm -hmm. in Absolutely, terms of yeah. their zoning? Yes, they're they're all looking okay. At that. So and and I think it, I've I've even seen how apartments are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yes. <laughs> they're not getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. They're, getting but they're getting very, yeah. very small. You should small. go, go yeah. and look at them. Well, no, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would laugh at them. You walk in. I've you, heard enough. You open the door, <laughs> you, you, the door opens into the toilet. Yeah, and it costs $4,000 a month. I know. You know that's, yeah. that's absolutely incredible. You know. So yeah. what I, will encourage landowners or landlords to be more public conscious and not just looking at the bottom line. Well, I think you, you need to, you know, and I, I have, this ties into a thread, I think, in some of your earlier questions. You know, I, I think the answer has to be, we need, find, we need to find ways of making this kind of win-win. And in the downtown areas, there's a really easy way of doing that, where you impose what are called community benefits uh, on the increase in development rights to landlords. So, for example, you have a parcel right now, you can only build three stories, that's what the current zoning says. Well, it's right next to the train station. We'll let you go up to six, but we want you know, uh, you know, 20, 30 percent of it to be affordable housing. Right. Or we want you to you know, make sure that there's extra green space. Or whatever it is that the community decides they want, you can give the developers a little bit of something. And in so doing, you're creating value for them. I mean, the public is creating value by changing the rules that um, govern what they can build. And so when you create value, you can ask for a little bit back. And then everybody wins. Um, I think, you know, you were asking before, you know, what do, you, what do landlords and what do the property owners think about the anti-displacement protections that we were talking about, like rent stabilization and just cause. And, and I think I want to be clear that, you know, no, again, nobody's saying that they can't operate their business, right? And, and I certainly want us to have landlords around because they provide housing that a lot of people need to live in. Um, these laws are designed to allow folks to make a fair rate of return on their investment. They have to. As a lawyer, I care about what's legal. And if you no, didn't you get a fair rate of return... Have, you have to define what's a fair rate of return. Well, certainly you could define that. But I think what I would say is, as a community, we can decide, you know, so what, is like 5 or 10% fair? You know, Is 30%? That, so, you know, to me, when 30% comes at the cost of displacing dozens of families, no, it's not fair. And I think that as a community, we can draw a line somewhere that's sensible, right, that allows people to make a reasonable return, um, but that also protects our community from predatory speculation. So what is, and you've mentioned a very interesting term, which is fair, which is open to interpretation. Certainly. Because what some people think is fair, others might not think is fair. Yeah, absolutely. Of what's fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. So where are we and what does the future hold? We talked about some of the obstacles. Well, I, I, th I think the first thing is that we cannot be wedded to ideology. So whether it's production, we need to build more. The bottom line is that we need more. Yeah. Supply and demand is true. It's always been true. Uh, we've always chronically underproduced. So the pressure has been building here. Um, but I, I think, you know, places like San Francisco have demonstrated that even when you, uh, the benefit of, of San Francisco is that it's, we're about the same size as San Mateo County. They're eight, about 800, 850,000, we're about 750. Um, they are a city and a county. We are 21 jurisdictions. Uh, they have been able to commit to building 30,000 units in, over the next six years. And yet, even with that acceleration in production, you still see the rents creeping up, up, up. If we were to try and do something similar to that, would really we need a lot more than 30,000 units here to, to meet the supply demand. First of all, it will take decades. And in those decades, it'll, the damage will be done. Um, so I think there needs to be, a, and then at any point in time, a city can hit the brakes on that. The political wills can be, you know, very uh, fickle and change on a dime. You know, you've seen some cities actually call for building moratoriums. Um, the bottom line is we need to build more units. But the question is, what do we do in the meantime? And as Silicon Valley, a, a place that reinvents itself time and time again, whether it's the internet, or mobile, or biotech, or any of these other technologies that come storming in 
and suddenly the rents increase, how do we preserve our traditional communities? Because they really are traditional communities at the heart. How do we buffer them against these tsunamis of innovation? So there would, would be people who would say change is going to come. You can't it hold change back. And also there are certain market forces, and the market will take care of itself. At what price? At what price? That's right. You know, in this so I think it's a matter of completely changing our thinking in terms of what the market should be allowed to do. And there, there's always this concern about government regulation. Yeah, like he said, Gabriel said, 100 and some odd units, only three? That's not even, what are those, three janitor closets? You know, that's ridiculous. That should, that should be, like you say, a percentage. There's a lot of greed in this county, period. There's a lot of greed and people have accepted this. It's like one big city, everybody's for themselves when I'm going around. Like, everybody's like a city all along the peninsula, got the earphones on, looking straight ahead. Nobody's talking to one another. It's like something you see in a science fiction movie. There's so much greed here, nobody pays attention to it, and now it's in their face. They need to set rules in there. They need to set rules down. Who you needs to set who, rules? The county. The county needs to set a set of rules that says, you build here so high, so much goes to, so many of those rooms will go a 20%, not 1% go, go to low-income people. And so you have what criteria. is it going to take? Public pressure? Public pressure. At the end and of the not, day, it's, it's yes. public pressure, but then it, it'll start to manifest itself in other ways. If you go to almost any downtown, particularly in South County, you're, you're going to see a lot of help-wanted signs. And those are, you know, the, the, for the uh, restaurant workers, the retail workers, the people who actually make the downtowns as vibrant as they are, and, uh, you know, we attract thousands of people from outside of a city to, the, to have a, a, a night on the town. Um, when that model starts to break down, um, when people are, you know, living outside of the county, working here, but at the end of the day, going home to the East Bay or the South Bay and spending their money there where they live, um, you know, that is another indication of, of a broken model. As these things add up, as asthma rates increase in, in this county, because people are living in substandard housing, waiting to be pushed out of the county, um, the you know the county's paying the tab for that. We're talking long term, though, and and this is what happening the need today. Is, <laughs> well, what I'm thinking is the need is short term, right now. The changes that need to be made. I mean, we can now, see the effects of unless we do something uh, significant. That short-term trend that you've identified will be a long-term trend. Daniel, what's the saving grace in all of this? Or is <laughs> there a saving grace? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so, uh, you know, you just asked, what does it take to change this, right? And, and to me, the answer is public pressure. When I think of public pressure, what that really means to me is you need folks who are a part of these communities to begin to get together and say, you know what, here's what our values are and uh, we're going to be organized around the way that we vocalize those values and we're going to hold our elected officials accountable to those values. Um, and I think what we're seeing now in this county in a number of different cities is an increasing number of folks who are willing to get together and stand up and fight for equity and fight for justice. As young as Gabriel, Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need Gabriel. I, I you expect need to vote for him 10, One 10 years day. from now. Yeah. So, Gabriel, what do you have to say about all of this? <laughs> I'm not sure I would want to be a public official. Oh. Oh. It's better to, uh, to tell them what to do. You will be in a position to have some influence in terms of the laws and the rent ordinances and what's happening to the people that you're currently fighting for. But why would you have reservations? Why are you not sure? I'm not sure what I want to do yet, but that's not one of my options. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that public pressure we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. You only want to be on the, the end of being a part of <laughs> putting on that public yeah. pressure. You yeah. know, um, Henry, um, I was, <clears throat> you know, I go around East Palo Alto, I see a lot of mattresses on the street, and that's not because a lot of people are 
buying new mattresses. <laughs> that's because they're being evicted. And they're just mm -hmm. dumping them on the street, either from the backyard, from the shed, or from the garage they're renting. But also, a lot of my friends, neighbors, a lot of them just happen to be Latinos, um, are moving from Jalisco, from um, Guadalajara, all parts, of, and further south down there, they're moving. They just can't afford to live. You know, you see people moving out, they're only lasting like a week in some of these houses. But anyhow, I'm looking are at- Are you it, saying they're moving because they out of East Palo Alto? They're moving out. East Palo Alto, it's cheaper to move to Redwood City than it is to East Palo Alto. The average house in East Palo Alto is 550 and up. Well, do you know, it's interesting. I saw this week a house going for rent at $4,500 a month in East, in East Palo Alto. It's mm -hmm. easy, $1,000 a bedroom and $500 a bathroom. And this uh -huh. is supposed to be a, a, a city that's always been Crime. one, a, like a, 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 a community of lower income residents. So that says something about the community changing. It is. Uh, and there's yeah. relationships that are being broken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's being able, having that stability allows people to build relationships and really that's what defines quality of life. It's, you know, the people that you touch right. and you can make a long-term difference in their lives. And I so, think yes. In East Palo Alto particularly there's great opportunity because the public officials are extremely responsive to the community and there's a lot of folks in the community who are very active and as at our own city we can enact our own laws to protect our current residents um, and I think you're seeing a lot of activity especially in East Palo Alto around this. And that to me is another ray of hope, you know, sort of in this crisis is that uh, I think that it has gotten to a point where people really are excited to become a part of articulating a solution to this. Uh, and in East Palo Alto, I think that our elected officials have open ears. They have the open ears. The community is changing, and as it gentrifies, it could very well be the city officials will also begin to reflect the changing communities. Oh yes, certainly that so. Will, that will that will happen. That surely will happen. You know, I always went there. I just had to add this in because we didn't talk about this. They talk about um, minimum wage going up. Okay, they've gone from some people have asked for seventeen dollars and one. Palo Alto, they've asked for $25 for minimum wage. And you know, $5 an hour is $800 a month. $10 an hour is $1,600 a month. And that's what, that's, that, but you don't bring home $1,600 a month. You bring home a lot less. Well, we'll People cannot to, we'll pay rent with that. End, we'll have to end it that there I'm with sorry. minimum wage being a big factor in this equation with public protests and people organizing being a big factor in this equation. So I would like to thank you in what time we have left for joining mm -hmm. in the discussion and giving us some you, insight yeah. in terms of what's us. going on. And I'd certainly like to thank our viewers for watching. Until next time.